Assalamu alaikum. When we are analyzing the results of a study and we look at the differences between groups or relations between groups and find that the p value is less than 0.05, we say that this relationship is significant because the probability of it happening by chance is less than 1 in 20. But what if we do multiple uh, tests on the same set of data, the same dependent or outcome variable? Say if we do this 20 times, 20 different questions to be answered from the same set of data, then we have 20 different p-values. Each may be significant because it can only happen by chance in a 1 in 20 situation. How are we sure about the validity of the significance then? And how can we deal with this? Here is an example of such a situation when we're trying to analyze the effect of several different factors on a certain outcome. Here we are trying to see the effect of different type of parotid surgery, like partial parotidectomy, hemiparotidectomy, total parotidectomy, radical parotidectomy, and radical parotidectomy with uh, neck dissection, and other factors like whether the tumor was adherent to the facial nerve or not, and the size of the tumor is judged by the MRI scan. All these def different factors may have an effect on the safety margin of the excised tumor or have an effect on the time it takes a tumor to recur if it recurs. So if we take one of the um, outcome variables like a safety margin or the time to recurrence and try to answer all the questions related to all these multiple variables, then you get different p-values here. And these p-values would be judged to be significant if they are less than a certain predetermined level at 0.05, because it's if it happens only by chance in less than 1 in 20 uh, times, then it is significant. But what if we have about 20 questions or a bit less than 20 questions here? How sure are we about the validity of this assumption? When we conduct multiple analysis on the same dependent variable, that is the output, for example, the time to recurrence for the tumor here, the chance that we commit a type 1 error increases every time we do one more test or put on one more factor into it. So if you have 20 different questions about the effect of 20 different things on the recurrence, and all of them are significant, there is a, a good chance that one of these significant findings is actually happened actually by pure chance because each of them has a chance of happening by pure chance of 1 in 20. In fact, the p-value of the alpha, that is here 0.05, should apply to the total number of a combination of questions on that particular outcome variable, say in this example, the time to recurrence. All the questions about the time, the relation of different factors to the time of recurrence should add up to this 0.05 combined so that you could have some of the tests, for example, at a P level of 0.04 and others at a level of 0.01, so long as the total number of the tests run on the outcome variable adds up to the P level of less than 0.05, then you can accept that if these are significant, this is a valid uh, result. One of the techniques for the correction of the p-value in multiple testing is the Bonferroni technique. Here, if you are repeating the test 10 times on the same output variable, and you have set up the p-value at o less than 0.05, then you divide this p-value, the alpha value, by the number of tests you have uh, conducted, the 10 in this example, 
and the resultant corrected or adjusted p-value should be 0.05 and any results of the 10 tests that is less or equal to this would be then significant. They would add up if you add up the result, the p-value of the 10 tests to the original alpha uh, at 0.05. A second way for correcting the p-value in multiple testing is to use the holm sedak technique, which uses a different approach. Say you are repeating the test on the same output variable, the time of recurrence or the safety margin, four times. Then you obtain four different p-values for four of the uh, tests you have done for, uh, for the answers for the four questions. Now you uh, rank these four different p-tests in an ascending way, starting from the smallest p-value we have obtained. In this example, it's 0 0.005 to the largest, which is 0 0.04. Now, in the Bonferroni technique, you would divide all of these p-values individually by four. That's the number of tests you have done. So you obtain a different p-value for each of these four tests. But in the holm sedak technique, you use a different approach. You leave the smallest p-value you have obtained as it is, because it's very small anyway. But the second smallest will be divided by two. So that rather than being 1%, it would be half percent. And the third would be divided by three. And the fourth largest would be divided by four and the fifth by five and so on until whatever number of tests you have run on the same output variable. And this way you would adjust the p-value uh, differently than not equally like the Bonferroni, you would, uh, you would adjust it in a different way depending on the rank of the p-value in the ascending order. It's uh, claimed that the uh, holm sedak technique is actually a bit better than the Bonferroni because the chance of getting a type 2 error is less. It would have the same chance of avoiding a type 1 error, but it would have a better chance of avoiding a type 2 uh, error. So it's probably used more. The third way is the Tukey test. It has an interesting name of Tukey's Honest Significant Difference Test. Here you apply a different formula, you take a different approach. There are certain constants that you take from tables, depending on the degrees of freedom and the number of tests. And there is a certain equation that the software would calculate, again, depending on the differences in the mean squares and the number of uh, individuals in each group. And it will come up with a certain number. And you look into it, the software would look into the differences between the two groups, all the groups uh, together. And if the differences exceeds that certain number that you obtained from the uh, calculations, then it is significant. If it's not, then it's not significant. So that's a third different approach to the same problem of uh, p-value in um, multiple testing. So in situations like this, when we have several different variables affecting one uh, dependent variable, like a tumor margin or time to recurrence here, and you have all these different p-values relating to testing all these variables against the dependent variable, then you would have to use one of the uh, three or more uh, ways of correcting the p-value to avoid a type 1 error. The need for multiple testing is not uncommon. When we're doing analysis of the variance or analysis of the covariance, for example, you will be having simultaneous results of different factors, different groups with one uh, dependent variable. The ANOVA would tell you, for example, that there are some differences in the uh, dependent variable depending on these four uh, different variables. But it wouldn't tell you which. It's obvious here that this is much higher than the others. But in order to determine which uh, of the four variables is actually different than the others, you would have to uh, conduct pairwise t-tests between 
the first and the second, and the first and the third, and the first and the fourth, and then the second and the third, and the third and the fourth. You will do six different tests because you have four uh, different variables here. So you would have multiple testing, each with a p value that would need to be adjusted either here by the Taki or the Bonforoni or whatever technique you are used to correct the p value. By this, we come to the end on this presentation on why and how we should adjust the p-value if we are conducting uh, multiple tests simultaneously. Salaamu Alaikum.